Hi everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the orthopedics part of uh, Grand Test 179. So we'll start with the question number 270, which is about in a fracture neck femur, in a 65-year-old lady, the treatment of choice is, well, as you know, in 65-year-old patients, we have to get them moving as early as possible. We cannot afford to make them lie down and do the conservative treatment because if you are trying to do the conservative treatment, the complications of lying down in the bed like DVT, bed sores, pneumonia will will not uh, do the justice to the patient. So we have to do some sort of surgical intervention. Now the surgical intervention is whether to replace the femoral head or to fix the femoral head. So we have these two options, whether to replace it or whether to fix it. And as you know, the chances of healing are less in elderly patient that compared to the younger patient, partly because of these features. As you know, the fracture neck femur has got very precarious blood supply and if and if it uh, and it is further decreased in the elderly patients. So, and the other reason is because fracture neck femur being an intracapsular fracture, uh, the fracture site bathes in the synovial fluid and the other issue is the uh, the cambium layer of the periosteum is absent in uh, neck portion of the femur and moreover being an intracapsular because of the hematoma collected in the joint that will increase the pressure within the uh, joint and that will further compress on the remaining vessels and these are the factors which will decrease the uh, healing of the fracture neck femur. Moreover uh, the more vertical the fracture is of the neck femur and the more will be the shearing forces in that case. Now the ground is pushing up and the body weight is pushing down so that's why the fracture will displace and moreover elderly cannot afford to have another surgery the aim of doing surgery in elderly is to get them moving as early as possible so the logarithm for treatment of fracture neck femur is so we have to see whether the fracture is undisplaced or the fracture is displaced so if fracture is undisplaced we must go for the we, we can go for the conservative management or we can fix the fracture with multiple screws. As we have discussed earlier, conservative management is not the treatment of choice in elderly hip fractures. So we have to think about something surgical intervention. Now if the fracture is displaced, now then we have to see patient's age whether that is less than 60 or that is more than 60. If the age is less than 60, then we try to do the osteosynthesis, we'll try to fix the fracture, we'll try to reduce the fracture. If it is reducible, then we can fix it with the multiple screw. If we cannot reduce it, then obviously either we have to do open reduction or if still we cannot reduce it, then we have to do the McMurray's osteotomy where we decrease the angle and uh, convert the uh, tensile forces or shearing forces into the compressive forces. And if the age of the patient is more than 65 years as it is in our patient, our patient is 65 years old, okay. So the best treatment is to replace it with the uh, femoral head. Now whether to do only hemiarthroplasty or total arthroplasty that depends on the involvement of the uh, estabulum. If the estabulum is involvement, we'll do the total hip replacement. If estabulum is not Im involved, so we'll go for hemiarthroplasty. So in this patient of 65 year old who has sustained the neck femur fracture and we presume that there is no, uh, there is no arthritic changes, there is no involvement of the estabulum. So the treatment choice is going to be hemiarthroplasty, which is answer A. Okay. So the next question is the splint used in the management of, uh, well, this is a von Rosen splint as you all, you must be aware of. Uh, this is used for the development dysplasia of the hip. So basically these two types of splints are used. One is von Rosen splint, okay, and the other is pavlic harness. The aim of using these splints is to keep the hips in abduction so that they can be contained within the estabulum and eventually the estabulum will develop and the dysplasia will be corrected. So this is von Rosen splint 
which is used for the treatment of dyspla development dysplasia of the hip? The answer is B. The question number 272, the instrument given below. So uh, this might be a little bit tricky for you guys. Let's have a look at the different instruments they have mentioned. The bone cutter has got sharp ends. Okay, it has got a beveled end like this. Okay, and uh, it is used for cutting the bones. Uh, usually, when we take the bone graft to nibble that, uh, to cut that bone into the smallest pieces, we use the bone cutter. And this is a bone nibbler. Okay, and uh, if you see the ends of the bone nibbler are kind of excavated. They are deep. Okay, with the sharp edges. So these are the sharp edges and this is going to be the deep area. So this is a bone nibbler which is used to nibble out the sclerosed bone which is present uh, when we do the osteotomies or when we do the uh, surgery for the osteomyelitis. And this is the bone holding clamp which we used to hold the bones while we are reducing or manipulating the fractures. So the answer of 272 is going to be B, the bone nibbler is the instrument shown in the figure. So bone nibble is used to make cuts, cut and draw from squeezed, sclerosed and so that the bone ends can unite. So below test is helpful in the diagnosis of, well this question uh, seems to be very simple because uh, they are examining around the shoulder so it, it cannot be hip, it cannot be femur, it cannot be scaphoid. So it has to be somewhere around the shoulder. Uh, so answer is pretty simple. This is the anterior dis test to examine the anterior dislocation of the shoulder. But what exactly this test is? So let's have a look. So this is basically a Dugas test. In this case, the, we ask the patient to place a hand on the opposite shoulder and we'll try to lower the arm to the chest. So while doing so, patient will feel quite a lot of pains and will say Dugas test is positive. Few other tests which we use in anterior dislocation of the shoulder is Hamilton ruler test. So what happens in this case is when there is a dislocation of the shoulder and the humeral head comes and lie below the coracoid process, the contour of the shoulder is lost, the convexity which is there on the shoulder is lost. So if in a normal patient we will try to put a ruler touching the acromion process to the little epicondyla of the humerus, they, that won't be possible because of the rounded contour of the shoulder. So but in case of anterior dislocation of the shoulder, because that rounded contour of the shoulder is lost, so we can touch a ruler to the acromion process and little condyle of the humerus. So we call this positive Hamilton rulers test. The other sign of dislocation is if you see uh, because of dislocation the axillary fold lies little bit below as compared to the normal side. So we call it Bryant's sign. Another sign is Callaway test or sign. In this test we try to measure the anterior posterior girth of the shoulder and because the shoulder has dislocated and humeral head is lying anteriorly, the girth of the shoulder will increase and will say Callaway's test is positive. So next question is the most common cause of the anterior knee pain. Well, all of these can be uh, causes of the anterior knee pain and we'll look at few other causes of the most common causes of anterior knee pain. First of all, the most common cause is chondromalacia patelli. What happens in this case is the cartilage below the patella becomes soft. So whenever patient is bending the knee, the cartilage will get pressed between the patella and the femoral condyle and patient will have pain usually on flexion from getting up from the sitting position or going upstairs. Runner's knee is patellar tendinitis. The patellar tendon, usually runners who put their knees on the ground, this patellar tendon gets get inflamed. Quadriceps tendinitis is another disorder which can lead to anterior knee pain. There will be inflammation of the tendon of the quadriceps and the extension of the knee is going to be painful. Patellofemoral arthritis is, uh, uh, will also lead to pain during going upstairs, getting up from the sitting position. But the, the main difference between chondromalacia and patellofemoral arthritis is that chondromalacia patelli usually occurs in 
teenage children or you can say in patients of uh, younger age up to 30s and all that whereas the patellofemoral arthritis is a disease of the elderly patient. The plica syndrome is something where the synovial folds get caught between the bone ends and lead to pain. It gives the symptoms of meniscal tear like locking. Then peripatellar bursa is something which is lying outside and it will it can if it gets inflamed it will be painful but uh, in this case the most common cause if we are talking about the most common cause of, out of the given causes the chondromalacia patelli is the most common cause so answer is going to be D and we see there is, there is a sign called cinema hall sign or theater sign or movie sign when somebody has gone to watch a movie and they are sitting there for two to three hours so after watching the movie whenever they get up they will feel quite a lot of pain anterior knee pain in the uh, knee so that is because when they are sitting the, the cartilage which has become soft get compressed between the patella and the femur and it will start paining the question number 275 osgood schlatter's disease is associated with osteochondritis of so let's have a look at the few common osteochondritis given in this the question though the osteochondritis of the tibial tuberosity is known as osgood schlatter's disease whereas osteochondritis of the calcaneal apophysis is known as severe disease and osteochondritis of the medial femoral condyle is also quite common okay but as the question asked osteochondritis uh, of osgood schlatter disease is associated with tibial tubercles so the answer to the question number 275 is going to be c so next question is a person presented with bone pain with swelling in the right leg on radiological examination or investigation the following picture was seen what is the probable diagnosis so diagnosis by exclusion the first thing we have to do in this case so because this picture shows a immature skeleton so the answer cannot be giant cell tumor because giant cell tumor is a tumor of the mature skeleton here uh, clearly you can see the epiphysis and metaphysis and the physal separation is there in between so this is not going to be giant cell tumor uh, the fibrous cortical defect is something which will look more sclerotic uh, rather than lytic lesion as this picture shows lytic lesion so so the two choices we are left with either aneurysmal bone cyst or simple bone cyst so we have to find out which one is the answer out of these two if we have a look at the simple bone cyst and we see the x-ray and mri of that patient so basically the lesion is usually cystic and a liquid signal will be there so there will not be any septations and there will not be any fluid levels whereas if you see the aneurysmal bone cyst so in this you can see the multiple septations will be there on the x-rays and here you can see the septations in the lesion okay in the you can see the multiple septa here okay and moreover if you see this carefully you can see the fluid levels multiple fluid levels okay so this is there only in aneurysmal bone cyst uh, so if you see the answers and the, the picture they have shown this picture shows multiple fluid levels in this uh, so this is going to be aneurysmal bone cyst the answer to the 276 is going to be a question 277 the following are the causes of insufficient insufficiency fractures except so the common causes of insufficiencies are osteoporosis rheumatoid arthritis paget disease fibrous dysplasia osteogenesis imperfecta in all these conditions the bones become usually weak and they can get fractured fractured even with a minimal force and melanostosis is the only disease which is a developmental disorder the cortex widens and become hyper dense okay and we'll see the uh, dropping wax candle sign 
and this kind of diseases usually are hyper dense and the chances of insufficiency fractures are very less so answer of the 277 is going to be melanostosis the question number 278 this is more like a uh, kind of uh, uh, pharmacology question the false regarding uh, denosumab used in the treatment of osteoporosis is um, denosumab is a human monoclonal antibody it combines with the receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa b beta ligand that is rankle by binding the rankle with the high affinity denosumab reduces the bone resorption if we see the features of this drug this is a humanized monoclonal antibody uh, to the receptor activator nuclear factor kappa b by binding with rankle with high FNT it reduces the bone resorption rapidly and reversibly inhibits the bone resorption and increases the bone mineral density uh, with subcutaneous injection uh, for three to six months and this is not the drug to be used in the treatment of SLE so the answer to the suit 78 is going to be D the the next question from grand test 179 is knee ankle foot orthosis we also call it k a f o is used in the management of so this is something which will look like this and uh, it helps in management of the uh, deformities or insufficiencies or instabilities of foot and ankle, uh, knee and ankle uh, region uh, this is used to control the instability in the knee and the lower limb by maintaining the proper alignment and controlling the motion so these instability in this part of the lower limb can be caused due to broken bones arthritic joint uh, ligament laxity muscle weakness or paralysis so these uh, this orthosis helps to support the limb and will neutralize these instabilities so the answer to the 279 is going to be B which includes the weakness or quadriceps muscles or hamstring muscles spasticity basically a, the weakness or spastic weakness of quadriceps and spasticity of the hamstring will lead to flexion contraction at the knee joint so this orthosis helps in controlling the movement at the knee joint as well as ankle joint so that's the end of the grand test 179 thank you